You're listening to The Agronomy Show, presented by Advanced Agrolytics. Well, hello, listeners. Travis Martin here with The Agronomy Show again, and we're excited to have you back for week three, episode three, and we're going to jump right to it. Hey, listeners, as a quick heads up, we recorded this episode on the morning of Monday, August 10th, 2020, just hours prior to the devastating storms that rolled through Iowa. So you're going to hear Gunnar Dinkla, an agronomist from our team, give an update on the crop just hours prior to that storm. So keep that in mind as you're listening to his commentary. Gunnar and I did re-record a short segment yesterday, Tuesday, August 11th in the afternoon. At the very end of the podcast, you'll hear just some brief comments on some of the initial takes on the damage that Gunnar's seen. So just keep that in mind for this week's episode. First on the podcast today is Jason Grevy. Jason joins us from Ohio. Jason, tell us where your home base is and the general region that you cover. Plus, give us a sense of a crop update there as we roll into mid-August. Yeah, Travis, appreciate uh, having me on here today. So my hometown is in Ohio on the western side of the state, and I'm an agronomist for advanced agrolytics covering uh, primarily west central Ohio through the kind of uh, central part of Ohio, I guess, primarily from uh, Columbus to the western side of the state. So that's pretty much the territory that I'm covering right now. As far as what I'm seeing in Ohio, as we kind of go through the growing season, so planting season was really a tale of two halves. There was pretty much 50% of the corn got planted that first two weeks of May. And then we kind of hit a little bit of a weather delay in the middle of May there that really held things up on a progress uh, standpoint until really towards the, the very last of May and even bumping into that first week of June before guys were able to get back in the field. So we did go through a pretty good dry clip there from really around the 20th of June all the way through about the, the 10th, 11th, 12th of July. So about a 20, 24 day period where really didn't receive a lot of rainfall. Soil evaporation rates were really, uh, you know, increasing and uh, started to see that crop get into some pretty good heat and water stress. Since then, we have recovered fairly well. The last three weeks, we've had pretty ample rainfall. Crop has recovered looking a lot better. As far as uh, progress, that early May corn, primarily in that R3, maybe just bumping the R4 stages right now, soybeans, primarily in that R4 to R5 growth stage. So I guess uh, as I kind of evaluate things here um, over uh, the next couple weeks, I'm kind of hoping that we continue with this rainfall. Uh, Soil moisture right now is good not really optimal yet, but we're we're skating by okay for the time being. So, you know, as you climb up in that northwest Ohio pocket, things do dry out a little bit up there uh, in that corner of the state. Have been a little bit more uh, moisture stressed over the past two, three weeks compared to some west central Ohio where we've had more rainfall. So overall, uh, liking what I'm seeing out of the soybeans, internode count, Pod counts are really good right now. Uh, Soybeans are shaping up really, really good as far as that goes. I guess we're kind of getting in the fourth quarter of of this crop's life cycle now, going into grain field where, you know, we're kind of turning our attention towards that seed weight and seed size component to drive that that final yield determination as we get into harvest. So that primarily is is kind of the update here in in the Buckeye State. So as we're kind of getting into grain fill and coming down the final stretch towards harvest, what are you really evaluating in the crops right now? So the first thing that I'm looking for, uh, specifically, I guess, starting with corn, I want to continue to monitor uh, our gray leaf spot presence in this crop. You know, we've had uh, a good chunk of acres that have had fungicide applications in that VTR1 time frame applied, but there's been a lot of acres that, you know, guys just opted to not pull the trigger on that application as well. So over the last uh, seven to 10 days, what I'm seeing out of this crop is definitely an increased presence of GLS, especially moving into that upper canopy. And uh, I just want to continue to monitor that on these acres that did not have an application applied and see how that progresses and how that affects that stay green and uh, that overall 
leaf area duration of that of that corn plant to see you know what we get into as uh you know we kind of get into senescence and and finish this crop out so soybeans i uh want to continue to kind of monitor and and uh check on insect feeding especially uh bean leaf beetle on that second generation as we get into stink bugs here uh, those pod feeders and just keep my eye on that the the other thing that I'm really kind of focusing on here going forward is some of these late season diseases on both corn and soybeans, uh, i.e. stock rots or getting into, you know, some stem canker or, um, you know, some anthracnose issues as we kind of come down the home stretch here. So the dry weather that we did have the last three weeks prior to getting some moisture is uh, possibly setting us up for a little bit increased presence, which You know, for us in the eastern uh, corn belt over here, stock rots is typically something that we do deal with uh, maybe a little bit more frequently than uh, when you get out into the I state. So always a a concern as we get closer to harvest and something that we need to continue to monitor and do our due diligence to make sure that, uh, that we're keeping our eye on. So I think the other important thing to remember is that what I kind of touched on previously as we get in the fourth quarter of this crop life cycle here, we can gain or lose a lot of bushels um, just on that overall seed size and seed weight component of that plant life cycle and process. So, you know, we just want to keep that stay green and that plant health clicking along and 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 not bail out on this crop and finish this thing out all the way through the end until uh, we really get combines rolling here. So I guess that's kind of what I'm looking at as we go down the stretch here. Um, over the next really 30 to 45 days and uh, get closer to harvest. Next up, we're going to hop over to Illinois and connect with Erica Parker. Erica, tell us about the general region that you work across and what are some of the common themes right now you're seeing across that territory? Sounds good. Thank you very much for having me on today, Travis. As you mentioned, my name is Erica Parker and I live in Dwight, Illinois, and I cover basically Northern Illinois and Northeast. So I'll cover down to Champaign, give or take, and then probably half an hour south of Chicago. And then I do a little bit over in Western Illinois as well. So pretty good breadth of the state. Typically, a lot of poorly drained soils, but I do have some sands in there that I work with as well, which provides a pretty good diversity for things to observe over time. And this year, you know, if I think about what I've been seeing as I've been walking fields, For the challenges that we had when we started 2020, I think much of the crop looks extremely strong. It's mid-August, and there's a lot of corn that's still green over most of the plant. We are starting to see some firing going on and starting to see some more diseases. There's some areas where it was extremely drought-stressed about a month ago, and we're still able to tell that. There's some areas where replant was significant, and the story still has a long way to go on those acres, but even the replant acres look very strong. The beans in the low area have been struggling some. They've turned yellow. They've struggled with all the anaerobic conditions we've played with every year. But generally, aside from that, the beans are fairly healthy and minimal lodging to date. So that's a great thing. A lot of the effects of the spring that we had in 2020, such as sidewall compaction, have been alleviated to a point with some of the forgiving rainfall we've had in a lot of my geography. For soybeans, a lot of the April beans are hitting 18 to 22 main stem nodes, and May beans are in that 15 to 16 range. June beans are in that 14 to 16 main stem node range, perspective. All in all, the crop at this stage looks better across most of my geography than it has has at this time and many of the recent, previous years recently, I should say. So if I think back over the last five years, At this stage of the game, I'm usually apprehensive about at least one or two different things. But right now in 2020, things are things look fairly good over most of the geography. That's good to hear. Very good to hear. So with that said, Erica, your question actually is really similar to Jason. So it'd be interesting to hear the differences. But what are you looking (laughs) for in fields right now, this time of year? Short answer is everything the crop is willing to tell us. So It's important to remember that what we learn now might or might not be actionable now, but we're also trying to think about and put our heads around how can we learn now? What can we learn now that would help us improve 
also the 2021 crop and beyond. So when I'm in soybeans, I'm looking at what is our final stand. And I have to admit, I've been surprised at how much lower our actual stands are versus some of our target populations in some geographies. And we've seen some attrition over time. So keeping an eye on population has been something that's continually observing. Also in beans, you know, how is our weed control program doing? What diseases are we seeing, whether they're SDS, phytophthora, charcoal rot, diaphorthy? What are the differences we're seeing in potable nodes between planting dates? You know, we want to keep pushing the yield potential higher and higher. And without observing what some of those differences are between some of the management tactics we're trying, it's kind of hard to gauge or understand how we may or may not be moving the needle. Other things in soybeans I'm looking at, it would be what management conditions have led to more potable nodes or more pods, et cetera. Just trying to put everything together. Granted, the combine will be the real decoder key for soybeans, but any visual observations that we can get that might help us understand what the combine will tell us shortly will be beneficial. On corn, corn, <laughs> corn is a little bit easier to read, or at least it speaks a little bit more clearly to you. If we're in a cornfield, I want to understand what the plant's trying to tell us, what the ear's trying to tell us, and for lack of a better way to say it, what's the fudge factor for these things based on the hybrid personality that you're in? You know, so if I look at the plant, just the plant, I'm looking to see, is it firing? And if it's firing, why is it firing? How is it firing? Is it because we're seeing nitrogen deficiency? Is it potassium deficiency? Or is it just general sloughing off of the lower leaves? All of these things can tell us something. Where are we seeing those symptomology? Is it in the low ground? Is it in the high ground? What management tactics are working or could we employ to try and prevent or delay these things from happening? You know, can we alter the nitrogen program? Can we alter how we look at fertilizer rates, et cetera? And also keeping in mind, you know, hybrids have personalities. They absolutely do. And some hybrids will fire faster than others. So it's helpful to consider you know, what hybrid you're in and kind of its personality while you're looking at these things so you don't overreact or underreact. Some other things that I'm looking at in terms of what is the plant trying to tell us while we're in the cornfield, what diseases are present, and what are the management tools. So, you know, gray leaf spot and tar spot, they overwinter here. So crop rotation can help. It's not perfect, but it can help. Fungicide can help, and hybrid selection can help on gray, but we're still not there on the tar spot. So while I'm observing these things, I'm continually trying to run through what are the management options this year and future years that we can work with. You know, as Jason mentioned, southern rust has been detected here and there in my geography as well. Knock on wood, I hopefully won't see any gosses wilt, but we've had it periodically over time. So I'm keeping my eyes out for that. And that's something the fungicide won't help with. And the last one that I really want to keep my eye open for is physoderma. And some guys get leaf, you know, we, we can see the physoderma leaf spot right now, but the node breakage is really the part that kind of has me keyed in more than the leaf aspect of it at this point in time. Right now, I'm not seeing much, but I did start seeing some of the, my first physoderma node, node breaks here in the past week or so. While we're in the cornfield, you know, I'm, I'm watching the plant, but the ears, the ears can tell a huge story. So understanding and knowing your hybrid's personality is important to understand how to interpret what the ear is telling you. You know, like Jason mentioned, looking at the kernel rose round, how happy was it at that V4, V6, V8 timeframe? The kernel rose round is driven largely by genetics, but it's influenced by environment. Some hybrids generally have 16 to 18 around. Some have 14 to 16. Others have 18 to 20, sometimes up to 22. So understanding what the hybrid is normal, what's normal for that hybrid is important understanding how to interpret what you're seeing in the field. And then if you think about the other, one of the other yield components, the kernels per row, now this is where it kind of gets even more fun because you break it down and there's a potential kernels per row, which is determined, you know, V10, V12. And that's somewhat determined by genetics, but I've seen it over the over years. I've seen it be impacted by environment more than girth. But that's just potentially how many can this ear have on it, you know, if everything goes right. Then we see pollination. 
did we have good pollination? Was it scattered? How many of the silks are still attached there at the tip? Never got a chance to get done. And then the one that usually catches our eye and can tell us a lot would be the tip back or kernel abortion. And every, a lot of hybrids respond differently to that. Plants can generally abort their kernels through R3, you know, through the milk phase. And some hybrids want to hold on to every one of those kernels as much as they possibly can, while other hybrids don't think twice about aborting kernels and they can abort, well, maybe let's just say a very full R3. So again, understanding your hybrid characteristics is important to understanding how to interpret what you're seeing when you're out there in the field. Kernel depth, you know, we're not quite there yet, but over the next few weeks, understanding how we're going to look at kernel depth will be absolutely critical. It's impacted by so many other decisions. You know, if the root systems are healthy or not, compaction, root rot, plant health, all of the and sufficient nutrients late in the season. All those things have to be clicking really well for kernel depth to be maximized. So it really all comes together. You know, one thing I've noticed while I've been out there looking at ears, there are some places that have had scatter grain, meaning there's some that uh, either didn't pollinate over the ear, randomly over the ear or aborted randomly over the ear. And we can talk about that some other time as to why that happened, but it's something to keep your eye open for. And then I'm starting to see some zipper ears too, which is usually indicative of some nitrogen deficiency. You know, after looking at these components individually, it's really about pulling it all together. Corn has a budget just like we do, people. And they've got a, they have to, the hybrids react to their environment the entire time. So they know how much expense they've basically had by setting these kernels. And the variables that they have to work with to hit their budgets right now, you know, through our three, they can still abort kernels and get rid of some of that expense if they choose to. After our three, really it comes down to can they adjust kernel depth or are they going to have to start rob robbing from the stock? If there's leaf diseases or nutrient deficiencies that come into play, it's like an added tax. And that plant has even fewer resources to maintain the expense of the kernels that it's kind of committed to already. If a hybrid is more likely to keep all the kernels at R3 without much tip back and it loses air leaf area due to diseases or nutrient deficiencies, Travis, those are the, some of the first acres I'm going to keep my eyes on for those stock rot concerns. Everything works together in the system. We can't just evaluate one aspect in a bubble. We really have to look at all of it. And we aren't just working with this year, but future years and well beyond 2021 as well. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. A great comprehensive answer for folks as they think about what their insights today can really mean for the future. So with that said, Let's kind of wrap up and head to Iowa, um, where we're going to link up with Gunnar Dinkla. Gunnar, tell us a little bit about where you're located in Iowa and what are you seeing across your territory these days? Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me on the podcast, Travis. So currently, I live in Des Moines, and I cover the majority of central Iowa, and I mainly go west to parts of southwest and west central Iowa. In terms of kind of a conditions or you know where, where we're at, my answer kind of just changed here in the last hour. We had a severe thunderstorm roll through and had 75 plus mile per hour winds, some rainfall, there's some hail in some spots. So I'm hoping when I leave here this afternoon, I hope it's not too ugly and I hope I don't jump on Twitter and see some, see some flat pictures. But really the story has been pretty consistent here in central Iowa and especially west of I-35 and west central Iowa in that we are we are dry. The new drought maps last week, anyways, uh, there was a three to four county area that fell into D3, which is considered a severe drought. I know that area caught a small shot of rain, maybe only a couple tenths last week, but nothing really meaningful to break this drought. That epicenter in that Sac, Carroll, Green, Guthrie County area, and then there's a whole nother ring around those counties that also have some really heavy drought conditions. I think just for a reference, Coon Rapids, Iowa, and Carroll County, I believe they've only received, I think it's close to four inches of rain since June 1st. They've been struggling this entire summer with dry conditions and warm temperatures. With this dry weather and with these warm temps, we've seen a, a speedy progression in our crops, and, you know, kind of a response to that dry weather. Corn is anywhere entering, I mean, we're in that dough stage, R4, 
there's a few places popping up where we're starting to dent already. So that probably leaves us one to two weeks ahead of schedule. But the thing is, these fields are between the fields and within the fields are uh, insanely variable. The amount of tip back from either poor pollination or as Erica alluded to, going into R2, R3, that moisture stress when we're aborting some of the kernels. And that's a huge talking point right now. Yield estimates in that area, unfortunately, I mean, it's going to be variable where, you know, some hybrids, some environments tolerated it better and some, you know, not so well. And so it's going to be hard to calculate either guesstimating on kernel weight or really what's out there in that field. Uh, And the combine, Erica said, is really going to tell us what's out there. All right. Thanks for that, Gunner. So curious, you you spoke to the drought conditions and how those kind of have spread across your general area in central Iowa. We hear a lot about the effects of moisture and high heat stress on corn, but what are the effects on soybeans? And, you know, as people mentioned, kind of classic August rains, will will those save the soybeans this year? That's a really great question. And, you know, maybe one that might be tough to answer, one that we might have to wait and see. So yeah, like in corn, the soybeans in our reproductive stages, uh, especially right now as we're in full pod and we're really starting to begin seed fill, we're in maximum water demand right now for water and nutrients for that soybean plant. So let's say the majority of soybeans are full pod beginning creating seeds or filling seeds. Having moisture stress right now is really critical. We all know that soybeans compensate really well. Uh, you can throw a lot at them. And I mean, so far, I mean, they've done a great job so far through this drought. But now we're at the point where we're pretty much done flowering and the soybeans aren't going to be able to compensate for, you know, stress induced abortions. So right now we're really, it's critical that we, we need to hang on to as many pods as we can and holding on to those pods and finally filling those seeds. It's a really moisture intensive process. And without that needed moisture that we're witnessing in a lot of these areas, it's going to be interesting to see where these beans take us. Like we said earlier, the combine is really going to tell us at the end of the year. But yeah, those August rains, I mean, they're notorious for, you know, either making or breaking the crop, but it might hold true this year. You know, like I said, to kind of just wrap it up, we're going to need the moisture to one, maintain those pod numbers uh, and two, to fill those pods to help us get to the finish line. Thanks for that, Gunner. Totally makes sense as folks kind of think what uh, what's coming down the pipe here in August. So with that said, as we think about the next seven to 10 days, guys, final thoughts going into the next week, whether it's what you're kind of maybe seeing on the radar, pest, disease related, anything like that. What are some general themes that growers need to have their their eyes and ears kind of geared towards? The next seven to 10 days, uh, you know, I kind of alluded to this uh, earlier, but really just continue to check on the presence of, of insects, specifically in soybeans, as we start to get into uh, seed fill and start to get in that second generation of bean leaf beetle, just identifying and monitoring those fields to make sure that we are not getting into a pod feeding situation that can affect the yield and quality of that soybean. And, uh, you know, if need be, if we do start running into some of these issues, be a little bit proactive and, and uh, potentially looking at making another insecticide application where warranted if we are seeing that pressure develop. The other thing that I'm kind of keeping my eye on is the, the movement of southern rust in this corn crop. You know, in our geography, we really haven't had a, a very strong presence of southern rust uh, over the past two years. However, with that being said, it is something that I'm continuing to keep on my radar as uh, you know, you kind of learn from the guys to the south and the impact that that has on a crop. And uh, you know, if if we do start seeing that coming in here over the next seven to ten days, potentially, just being willing and and adapting to uh, potentially having to go back in and and uh, make another application of a fungicide to protect that crop against any southern rust movement if it were to show up. So, you know, those are a few things that I'm kind of keeping on my radar here over the next seven to ten days as we kind of get to the middle and and end of August to uh, uh, keep on our radar. If I think about the next seven to 10 days, uh, diseases in corn are going to be very important for me to keep keep an eye on. I haven't seen much, but their southern rust is there. I haven't seen any tar spot yet, but it's to the north and to the west of me. Physoderma and thracnostop dieback and crown rot are the other things I'm definitely keeping my eye open for. So if you've got the crown rot, make sure to bring your spade when you're walking. 
always kind of handy. And some of the management tactics that may include another fungicide app in a few cases, but more than likely with the way how quickly the crop is progressing and just in my geography, if I start to see a lot of those things, it might not, it might require another fungicide app, but more than likely it's going to drive harvest priority and management choices for future years. Insects and corn, I'm hoping I don't see a resurgence in aphids like we saw in 2019, but I'm definitely keeping my eyes open on that side. I'm starting to see a few more corn rootworm beetles here and there. The replant would be the number one place I would look for that. So if a guy is going to be corn on corn and he's got some replant, that's the number one thing I would look for in that situation for a management tactic and just overall gauge of how, what the pressure is going to be. For soybeans, looking for diseases, SDS, diaporthy, which is pathogen behind stem canker and the geographic zone lines, cotton stem blight. Usually those things start to become apparent here shortly. And also SEN, it's been a lot, a lot of times I'm able to not try and be too gentle, but I can pull soybean plants up and see SEN on the roots too. In addition to the diseases and the insects, this is the best time to go out and meet your hybrids and varieties personalities. It tells you so much about how they're going to react and what to expect and how we can work on placing them. So it's just continuing to do our best to hear what the crop has to tell us. So we can push for that yield potential going into next year as well. For a seven to 10 day outlook, uh, it's obviously our goal to continue monitoring our crop progress and conditions as we turn the corner headed into the rest of grain fill towards maturity uh, and ultimately dry down and harvest. As Kelly alluded to last week, there are some corn rootworm areas that need attention uh, in terms of assessing damage and creating that harvest plan that she talked about and plans for next year. We've also seen some areas with a little bit of corn earworm, even on some traded corn, but not necessarily at levels of economic concern, but they are out there. Lastly, uh, a little thought and prayer for growers across the state affected by today's storm event. I've heard slash seen a lot of reports of completely flat corn and soybean fields, shredded grain bins, torn roofs, and more. Just want to say that we're thinking of you all. Uh, we had an excellent crop in a lot of areas, especially headed east. Um, it's just, it's really gut wrenching to see what occurred today. Hoping for the best as we begin to evaluate what's out there uh, and that there are some manageable fields once we get down the home stretch. Gunner, great point to end on there. As an advanced agrolytics family, we are thinking of all the producers and their families, as well as anybody in the industry who was affected by the devastating weather in Iowa this week. We at the Agronomy Show will stay up to date on what the coming days and weeks are going to look like for those folks, and we'll keep all of our listeners updated on ways that we can help those communities in the future. So with that, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Please subscribe wherever you listen, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Also, don't hesitate to give the Agronomy Show a follow on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And if you have any questions for our agronomy team for next week's episode, you can submit them at theagronomyshow.com. Everyone take care, be safe, and we will talk to you next week. Thanks for tuning in to the Agronomy Show podcast. For more information on the Agronomy Show and Advanced Agrolytics, head to advancedagrolytics.com.